So church, I'm going to ask you to, to stand if you would, and we will read the Word of God together. You were, if you were here last week, you remember that in our series that's called Futures, we're looking at the future doctrines, the, the, the doctrines of the Bible that speak about the future. We call it Bible prophecy. And the reason why we're doing this is because during this time of life, during this time as this church is, it is absolutely necessary that we know what we believe when we say that we're a Christian. <laughs> if you say you're a Christian today and you do not know what that means, then can I ask you this? How in the world can you say you're a Christian? And let's be honest. And I mean this, I, I don't, I, by, by no stretch am I being political right now. I have the amazing opportunity to say this. Uh, your background, genetically speaking, you may be, as I've met people today, you may be Argentinian. I've met some Peruvians today. I'm, I don't look like it, but I'm predominantly Portuguese and Pacific Rim. Um, what are you, German? Is it English for you? If we drew blood from your veins, we would know for sure. But you're standing in a country right now that has no DNA marker. This is the United States of America. I'm going somewhere with this. It's biblical. Hang on. <laughs> you can be here and you can be a citizen. You can file your income tax. You can put an American flag on your house. But it doesn't make you an American. There is no American bloodline. I can't draw blood from you and run it through an analyzer and get anything about American out of you. I'm going to get German, Irish, French, Dutch, African. Are you with me? Yes. Because this place is the place where you're supposed to choose to be here because you believe in what it is. Yes. Only other place on earth you can do this. Right here. You've chosen to be here. Mom was born here. Being born here doesn't make you an American. It means you have citizenship. It means you're legal. But to be an American is to choose to believe in what the founders left us. You can be in church. We can pull your blood, and it can be from a long line of Baptists or Lutherans or uh, Assembly of God or Catholics or whatever you might be. But no blood pulled from your veins would say or indicate that you're going to heaven. So wait a minute. I've got my baptism record from my Catholic church. It doesn't matter. Is the kingdom of God in you? And that's why the Bible tells us in heaven... John saw everyone who was there, and they were from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. In heaven, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know what that means? That means when we're in heaven, we're going to see people who have ethnic, ethnic backgrounds that we'll identify. Every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation will be in heaven. Not because they were Baptist, Lutheran, Catholic, or you name it. Because there was the sacrifice of one lamb, the lamb of God, Jesus, who brought this family together, and it's what you believe about what the truth is that gives you the right to call yourself a Christian. And as we look at our study regarding heaven and will you be going there? This is a serious message today. I don't know if you have friends that attended first and second, but people walked out just crying miserable today. I mean, you could, the, 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 you could hear the air getting sucked out of the room because what we're going to be talking about is deadpan serious. And, and you're going to hear stuff today that you're not going to hear in a church because you can't grow a church if you say the things that I'm about to say from the Bible. My reason for doing this is if you want to play games, you're in the wrong place. If you're serious, 
and you want to get ready, and you want to know for sure that you're going to be in heaven, then today's your day. This is, this is literally, this is serious, serious stuff. God is true. The Bible is true. Heaven is real. Hell is hot. And he loves you. He loves you, and you need to understand. So we're going to be reading from these selective verses or passages that we read last week from. I will read the odd-numbered verses. If you'll join with the even-numbered verses, Revelation chapter 21 on the screens. I'll begin verse 1. And by the way, as I read this, I want all of you to pay close attention. We're going to be talking about heaven. Watch it. Watch for it. There's, listen, there's the heaven where God is. Theologically, I, I could argue and be right that wherever God is, there is heaven. Read Psalm 138. Okay? Psalm 138, 139. So, we're going to be reading about the future. And I want you to pay close attention to things like water, trees, light, cities, kings, countries, nations, Jesus, throne, forever. Okay? John says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, listen what John hears, this is amazing. Behold, look, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Doesn't that sound good? Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for those words are true and faithful. Verse 7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Wow. Revelation chapter 21, now verse 21, starting there. The 12 gates, talking about heaven. The city coming down. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Listen to this. Each individual gate was of one pearl. By the way, that's one solid pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Wow. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 7, and this will be the end of it here. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. There shall be no curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their 
There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Oh. Verse 6 ends by saying, which must shortly take place. Verse 6 and verse 7 uses a term about shortly and quickly. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, this uh, Genesis is over here and Revelation is over here and it's going to go quickly. It means that once the, once the end time events take place, that period goes very fast. You won't have to wait around when the clock moves when that stopwatch goes. Verse 7, this is Jesus speaking. Behold, I am coming quickly. Behold, I am coming. When it starts, I will be coming very, very, very shortly after that. Blessed is he. That's why we're doing this series. Listen, blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Again, Father, we pray that you'd fill us now with your Holy Spirit's power to be students of your word. And after we've studied... Give us the power, for we know it is your will, to do your word. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. And as we look at this, we opened it up last week with this title regarding heaven, Will You Be Going There? And we saw, first of all, one single argument occupied our time, and that was the reality of heaven. So that's where we began, is that there is the reality of heaven itself that the Bible speaks about. And there were three things that we saw that encompassed that argument regarding heaven. In a recent poll, 120 people were asked, 121 technically, were asked, if you died, would you go to heaven? 120 people said yes, before one person said, I think I'm going to hell. So for every 120 people, one of them had the honesty to say, I don't think I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to make it. By default, the American interviewed on the street thinks he's going to heaven. And we've, we've taken heaven and we've made it almost something of boredom. Heaven, oh yeah, heaven, yeah, sure, I'm going to heaven. Like it's nothing. And yet from cover to cover of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, this book is a book of redemption. You need to know that if you don't. This book is all about getting you back into the presence of God now and forever. God wrote this. God provided it. God made the way of salvation. And it's God who extends the invitation. Come to heaven with me. Jesus said, come and follow me. Remarkable. Here's the funny thing. You might feel better if I were to put up on the screens right now. These are the 10 rules that you must obey to attend this church and eventually make it to heaven. And people without faith will say, write that down. Oh, wait, let me, hold it. Let me take a picture of it. Let me copy that. That's, that's sick and dangerous. But that's the human works mindedness of us trying to watch trying to get back to something that we know on the inside we've lost or we do not have. Listen, doing good things, people, is a wonderful thing. We need all of you. You need me to do good things. We want good citizens. That's fantastic. And you can't exactly fault the person holy who says, I do good things so I can go to heaven. Their motives are wrong. What they're trying to do, though, is a good thing, and we appreciate that. My argument is, is, not, is that not a valid argument regarding heaven or not? Clearly it's not. You can't go to heaven by being good, but here's what I'm saying about the person that is driven to do good with hopefully being accepted by a god or gods to let them in is that they know down deep inside there's got to be some form of reformation, some form of change in my life to do something that will maybe outweigh my bad so that I can win in the end. And I'm, I'm just pointing that out as a virtue this way, 
they are admitting by their actions that they have fallen out of friendship with heaven and they're trying to find their way back. Their way back is all cockeyed and weird and wrong and it's unacceptable to God. But they're groping, are they not? They're looking for some form of merit or standard that they can make their way back to. And my, my point is they're searching because they're lost and they know it. They will look to works. They will look to effort. They will look to good deeds because they know that there's a vacancy inside of them. God turns and says regarding the reality of heaven that we all need to take notice that he has given us enough evidence. This is where we are at last time where the atheist can debate the existence of God in heaven but it's futile. The evidence is overwhelming. I'm pretty sick and tired of people saying without any knowledge whatsoever, you can't prove the existence of God. I believe you actually can prove the existence of God if you just apply reason and logic. And what I mean by that is this, that there's a natural witness that we learned about that God has created what has been created. It's brilliant and it's obvious. Somebody, and you can, listen, you can use this. In books of evolution and argumentation like that of, of a creation without God, they will say, all you have to do to believe in evolution is to look at an embryo. And they will put up an embryo of a monkey. And I challenge you right now, don't do it now, I need you to pay attention, but do it later. You put up an embryo of a monkey, put up an embryo of a giraffe, put up an embryo of a fish, put, wait, do fish have embryos? Thank you. But you could still put up the egg of the fish. Hold it up there in the light. Put up the embryo of a human. Put up the embryo of a rhinoceros. You pick it. You have to, guess what? They all look the same. Have you seen them? And an evolutionist will say, ha, that's proof that evolution's true. And they walk away like they won the argument. Oh, the exact opposite's true. The exact opposite's true. So how do, you, how do you figure? Because the same God who claims in the Bible to be the creator of all life, when you look at the embryo of a monkey or of a giraffe or a human, it does look exactly the same. You know why? Because it came from the same mind. It came from the same designer. Why mess with a good thing? Apparently it works. If God wants to make a giraffe, this is how it goes. It means that he's the creator. It doesn't mean that he didn't do it. It means that his fingerprints are universally on everything. And when those things go and move and develop out of the stage of looking the same, are they quite different or what? Thankfully so. Remarkable. Creation. Creation screams. So I believe in science. Right on. Then you should bow your knee to Jesus if you do. The evidence is overwhelming. We looked at that last time. Secondly, we saw last time that there's the personal witness of consciousness. We had some fun with that because we talked about how you and I as humans, we have a, obviously we have a consciousness. We dream, we wonder, we write poems, we, we, we do uh, you know, whatever, M music and, and letters and expression. That comes from your consciousness, from the spiritual side of who you are. And we made mention of the fact that there's no bodily part of your physical existence that has the conscience department. <laughs> it's not by your right ear. It's not over on the right side, the middle, the deep part of your brain. It's not down around your thyroid. It's nowhere near your pancreas. It doesn't exist because you are functioning a bio machine for this world. It's called your body. And we focus on it. We draw attention to it. Uh, we put um, deodorant on it. And the older you get, the more deodorant you put on it, the more the cologne. Why? Because you're dying. You got to cover up the stink. Why? Because this body is dying. But the, notice the consciousness stays. And the Bible tells us, and by the way, science tells us that at the moment of death, it's interesting. Life, the world will say that life ends. The Bible says life left. And when you die, 
Will heaven be your home? Will you be going there is the question. There's a natural witness that says, I'm God, believe in me, I've made all of this. There's the personal witness of consciousness where you think God thoughts and you wonder about God. Remarkable. You and I talked about the joys and the hopes and the expressions. But being human, we're also able to confess the conviction and the guilt and the shame that's in us. The personal witness of consciousness And this is where we left off last time. Here we go. We're diving into this now. The third one is the divine witness of revelation. So what do you mean divine witness of revelation? God's divine testimony, witness, revelation of his revealed will, which is called the Bible, the word of God. So God has given, listen, he's given you three witnesses. I love this because the Bible says, Before two or three witnesses, the truth shall be established. Doesn't it say that? There's the natural witness of God's existence. There is your conscience. The fact that you are a body, soul, and spirit. And thirdly, there's the revelation of God's word. And you might say, well, pastor, that's where I have our time. I don't believe. I think the Bible's a bunch of fairy tales. That's what you believe. That's what you think. But on what basis have you come to that conclusion? Who told you that? A professor at school? A neighbor? Where did you read that? How do you know this? On what authority? For example, and I'll be off. I won't be too far off, but I think there's like 620 copies that have been qualified as source. Most documented book in the world is Homer's Iliad. You want to talk about Shakespeare, it's a waste of time because, you know, Shakespeare's writings, you know, Will didn't write them all. Did you know that? I'm reading Shakespeare. You don't know that. It's, his name's on the book. I write, you don't know because there's a lot of people who contributed to Shakespeare's writings. So forget him. You got to go back to Homer. If you're going to document something, you got to go to Homer. 600 and some odd confirming documents. You know how many confirming documents there are of the Bible? If, if Homer's the most quali- uh, qualified book in the world, that's a qualified book in the world among secular books. The Bible has nearly almost 14,000 manuscript copies of the Bible that are unified, cohesive, and complementary. In other words, for example, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in Qumran, Israel, they matched them up against the old King James Bible. Imagine finding the Bible in these beautiful, huge cisterns or pots. You take them out, they're on skins, parchment skins, parchments and skins. They take them out, they lay it out, they go through it, they got the old King James Bible. And they go through there, and there it is. Verbatim. Verbatim. Thousands of years, verbatim. God's witness of revelation. So we just ask these questions, and why is this important? Because we're talking about the topic of heaven and hell, ladies and gentlemen. We need, to be, we need to build a foundation as to why you should depart from your life that is taking you on the path of hell and destruction, and you need to understand why you should get on the road and get the straight and narrow way, Jesus said. By the way, that's not the, that's not the boring and, and uh, tedious way. The straight and narrow is, the way that, is what he calls it to be. I have to argue with you. It's the most exciting, fulfilling way of all, but you need to know. And I understand this. You have to understand me when I tell you this, that the message you hear today, you may not ever come back to this church again. And I want you to know, I'm doing this intentionally, not to drive you away, but to have this last opportunity to make sure that you know the truth. Okay, that's the, that's the, that's the greatest. If I, if, I, if I am called to show you love, I'm loving you right now. Because I'm giving you the truth that you'll have to talk to God about, even though you may hate me forever. 
That's fine with me if you know the truth. The number one thing out of the four, I'm going to give you four things right now. The historicity of the Bible. Can you trust the Bible? The historicity or the historical record of the Bible. Should I put my faith in what God has said in the Bible? Well, let's look at the history. And I'll give you a few because time doesn't allow me to go through much. History. History. The Bible says, let's talk about history. The Bible says, for example, there was a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, forget about the Bible. Do museums and other forms of literature and evidence say that there was a king named Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah. Yep. In fact, you can go to the British Museum in London, and you can also go to the Museum of Pergamum in Berlin, Germany, and you can see his throne, you can see his gates to his palace, you can see remnants, actual artifacts from the Babylonian hanging gardens, one of the wonders of the world at that time. What about the Persian Empire? The Bible says there's a Persian Empire. Is there evidence to substantiate the historicity of the Bible? Of course, museums are filled with Persian artifacts from its governing empire. What about King David? You ever heard, about, heard of that guy before? King David. There used to be a program some years ago called the Naked Archaeologist. He claimed to tell you the naked truth about all things, that he wouldn't lie to you, and he didn't lie, but uh, he had an atheistic background. He's Jewish. You, some of you know who I'm talking about, and he does, he's not fond of the Bible. When he did a show on it, he would make fun of the Bible, and that's fine until... When one time he did a program and he said there was no David. If there was a David, he was a um, little boy guy who created a myth. And then he became a legend. It's all trumped up stuff. Until archaeology, which we'll touch on in a moment, brought forth evidence that revealed not only David and in, 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 uh, in writings of David, but... <laughs> You can get on an airplane right now and fly 15 hours L.A. to Tel Aviv, get out, and we could drive to Jerusalem. It's about a 45-minute drive up the mountain. And before we get to um, uh, the main city, we'll stop at the old city of David. It's been completely unearthed, and you can walk through his rooms. So then why are you not a believer? There's also the archaeological evidence of God's revelation. Archaeology is a science, you know. And so you read a, an area in the Bible. This is kind of fun. All of us have heard of the Valley of Armageddon, but you may not be aware of how incredibly beautiful it is. It looks so much like, almost identical to, a giant version of you know where um, Monterey is? Monterey, here, California, Monterey. You know Salinas? You know where the Grapes of Wrath, John Steinbeck? Remember that? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Up there, isn't it beautiful? There's artichokes, there's lettuce, this side of the street, this side of the street, tomato, that side of the street, broccoli, this side of the street, asparagus. It's amazing. Megiddo, Harmageddon, where the last battle will be on earth. It's beautiful. Did you know that there are archaeological places where we go to on our trips. Hetzor, for one, or Megiddo. Why? Because there's massive stables that have been unearthed that are 3,000 years old. Tons of them to hold hundreds and hundreds of horses and garages, this is all underground, garages that held hundreds and hundreds of chariots. Do you know who owned them? Good. Solomon owned them. What did God say to Solomon? Solomon, I love you. You're amazing. And for you asking for nothing for yourself in your prayer, I'm going to give you all that stuff, and I'm going to give you wisdom, and I'm going to bless you. No one's going to be able to rival you. I'm going to be good to you. And Solomon, right on. It's awesome. <laughs> and you know Solomon is the wisest man that's ever lived. And... Yet God told him, I'm going to bless your life as long as you don't add to yourself horses because you're going to trust in the, those weapons of war and not me. So I'll take care of the nation. Don't trust in your aircraft carriers and in your submarines. I got gotcha. you. 
Oh, and you know what? Your chariots, don't trust in your tanks. I got you. Because when you put your trust in those things, you'll forget me. Oh, and one other thing, Solomon. Um, I'll give you a wife. One. Don't add to yourself women. So what do you do when you go to Megiddo or, or Hitzor and you dig? You find stables and you find out that the Bible warned us that... So how many... I'm, I'm lost count. How many wives did he have? 700? Was it over 700? And then that's not to mention two or 300 concubines. You have 700 women that are designated to be your wife, and then you have 300 sex toys, women. That's all they're for. Do you realize you do the math? I don't know, you can do the math, I can't. But you figure out, man, if you're going to go on a date with Solomon, if you're in that harem, you might go out with him like once every eight years. (laughs) Is that weird? God said, don't do that. What did he do? He did it. He did it. And when you dig, archaeological evidence shows you. So why aren't you not a believer? Eschatological arguments, not going to belabor this. God writes the future down in advance. It's called Bible prophecy. And uh, today, one of the greatest growing superpowers in the world is Israel. Since 1948, a nation born twice, exactly as the Bible said. Fourthly is what's known as the ontological argument. This is the, it's a big word, but it means a reasonable, things that are reasonably obvious. Things that are reasonably obvious. An ontological argument is that it's reasonably obvious that these chairs were built for you to sit in. You see, that's ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? It's so simple and obvious that it's ridiculous, Right? Say, I'm going, to go, I'm going to go to Sacramento. How are you going to go there? I'm going to walk. Why would you walk when you can take a plane? Because you get there faster if you take a plane. That's an obvious reality. You'll get there faster if you take a plane. There are things that are so obvious that they're there in front of you, and it's crystal clear. I shared this with you guys last week, I think. I get so confused because I teach differently at almost each service. It's different. <laughs> It depends on how much food I haven't have. <laughs> and by third service, I start to lose my mind. <laughs> but this is obvious. To me, this is obvious that there's a God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We don't worship three gods. We worship one God who reveals himself in three personalities, three persons. He's one God. So I don't get it. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because when a man, is this what I said last week? Yes, yes. Yeah? Yeah? Remember, when a man connects with a female in, there's, I saw some young faces, so I'm doing the best I can right now. When, a, when, when daddy and mommy are going to wrestle for a, for a moment at, at what's happening, you've got the creation taking place, and, and in, in a sense, you have three pregnancy, you have three in one. You have three in one. You've got one inside the other, inside the other. It's amazing. To me, that's crystal clear. It's not a problem. God has revealed these truths to us that we should have no struggle with. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119, verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. God's word doesn't change. God's word's true. Moving ahead, Psalm 19. Look at Psalm 19. It'll be on the screen here in a moment. Verses 7 through 9 is absolutely awesome. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord 
are true and righteous altogether, all surrounding, all encompassing. Think of it. Did you hear that? Did you see that? All of this is his word. The law, testimony, statutes, commandments, fear, judgments, his word. Keep that verse on the screen. Look at this. The law of the Lord is perfect. Skip down. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Next, the statutes of the Lord are right. The commandment of the Lord is pure. The fear of the Lord is clean. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. This is what the Bible says about itself. Ask yourself, anyone who inclines themselves, puts themselves to study God's word, if there's not a radical moral effect that changes it. I'm not talking about becoming a theologian. We're not interested in more theologians. We want disciples. Don't pontificate about what it means if you're not going to do it. If you're going to study it, God expects us to live it, right? So, watch this. How does these truths affect me? Again, Psalm 19, watch. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That's how your soul's converted. It's the law of the Lord. It is perfect. And what does it do? It convicts me that I'm a sinner and I need to be changed. Today, if you cannot agree with that first statement of verse 7, you've got serious, eternal problems, friend. You're telling God that he doesn't know what he's talking about. That first statement in verse 7 is the Lord saying, you need me very badly. I will live on forever, I'm God. You need my salvation. And that's your first challenge. Second challenge is, listen to this, the testament of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Making wise the dumb. Making wise the person who doesn't know. This is an amazing thing. Wisdom is spectacular. You can be a genius. You could have graduated from MIT or Stanford. You could be, you could be a Harvard whatsoever, you know? You're smart. You know what that means? It means you're smart. You can make the dumbest decisions in life. I know some people like this. I hope they're not watching right now. <laughs> Just dawned on me as soon as it came out. Whoops. But you can have all these degrees and you can have all of the theories and stuff and get up and walk right through a, a glass window. I didn't see that. You should open your eyes when you walk. Yeah. Listen, wisdom is the application of knowledge. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is knowing how to use knowledge. Listen, God says in James, I will give every one of my children wisdom if they ask me for it. So ask. Isn't that amazing? You can be brilliant on paper and not be very wise. You'd much rather have wisdom. Thirdly, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Does not the world need a rejoicing heart in these days? Happy New Year! COVID round two. <laughs> and we saw the suicide rates this week in California. Gee, I wonder how that happened. There's something worse than sickness, friends. And that's losing your heart and your mind to depression. Wow. You know what? We need some rejoicing of the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Isn't that, that even sounds good. It sounds like you're going to a doctor, go down to Newport Beach. I'd like to have my eyes enlightened. <laughs> right? What would you like? My eyes enlightened. <laughs> Can't do it with a blade, though. There's no tuck and, tuck and roll for that one. <laughs> it's a matter of, of the countenance of your soul. To have your eyes enlightened <laughs> is to realize, hey, wait a minute. Uh, I belong to God. This whole universe belongs to him. I don't know what's happening. I don't need to know. I trust him. So what kind of, and people, when you do that, your, your neighbors and friends will go, what are you nuts? 
What do you want me to do? I want you to be miserable like me. <laughs> I want you to get down and grovel in your terror. I want you to be... I said, no, no, you know what? I just read the Bible, went to church today, and the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Wow. God's amazing. I'm going to go with him. Verse 9 says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. I'm going to be on his side. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. There's one thing we know for sure. Nothing else is true and righteous but God. Number two, as we come to this today, heaven, will you be going there? The fact that there is in hell is the absence of heaven. What makes hell hell? A lot of things. But one of them is the absence of heaven. We talk about heaven. We read about its glories a moment ago. But we also read in a few of those verses where it says that none of these will enter in. None of these will enter in. And there's a list given there. But right now we're going to focus on the fact that there's an absence of heaven. And when that takes place, there is hell. Jesus told us and spoke to us about heaven and hell in Matthew 25, verse 41. By the way, Matthew 25, 41, you may find it interesting to know that Jesus spoke about hell more than any other person in the Bible. And given what he did at the cross to keep people from going there, makes sense to me. He doesn't want you to go there, so don't go there. (laughs) He says, then he will also say to those on his left hand, this is the day of judgment, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Did you know that? That hell was made for Satan and his minions, not for humans. This presupposes, by the way, that hell was created before Adam and Eve were created. We don't know when it was created, but we know it was after the fall of Lucifer, but before the arrival of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God made hell for Satan and his fallen angels to be confined there in eternity. You say, well, then why would humans go there? That's a great question. Why? Why go there? The Bible is very simple on this because, quite frankly, we are disciples of the flesh, the world, and the devil, it says in 1 John. Without Christ in our lives, we will do what the world tells us to do. We will do what we want to do. We will do what we desire. We'll follow people. The enemy of our souls will influence us or we'll make our own decisions. And unless Christ is involved in your life, that's the path that you're on right now. In the hearing of my voice, that's the path that you're on. You're, you're waiting right now for church to be over so you can go out and do your, the, that, that thing that God is maybe saying to you, yeah, I don't think you should do that. You shouldn't be doing that. You say, man, that's, that's so unloving. Oh, my friend, if you think that's unloving, you don't even know what love is. If you tell your kid, don't play on the freeway, you're going to get hurt. Oh, man, don't, don't, don't fence me in. (laughs) Really? You seen those parents where the kid, the kid's about this big, and uh, the kid goes, the the, the kid goes, I want that. And the parent goes, no, you can't have it. Ah! Okay, okay, you can have it. You seen that happen? Man, those kids have got those parents trained really well. We do that in life. I want this. I want that. Listen, unless Jesus rescues you from you, you are going to pull yourself down into a pit that you ought not to have gone to. It's all on you. It's not on him. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Problem with Pain. It's a great book, by the way. He said, this is where I have a problem. He said, this is I have a problem. When I first became a Christian, I read about hell. He said, if there was any doctrine that I could remove out of Christianity, it would be the doctrine of hell. I'd remove it. But he said, I can't do that because it's the number one topic that our Lord spoke about. It's confirmed in Scripture. Listen, 
And anyone knows, here comes an ontological argument. Anyone knows. If you're playing at a game, you have to assume that someone's going to lose. Have you thought about that? Listen, I don't mean to upset people exactly, but we live in a world where not only can there not be any death, you can't die of anything. It's not acceptable anymore. Did you know a, you know, a million and a half so people traveled this last week on airplanes in America? And people are furious. I, we can't believe that they flew. <laughs> no, have you seen the news? It's amazing because like a record was set. You know what happened? If you applied that thinking, you ran the risk of getting in an airplane or driving in a car. Can you imagine? You should never have driven in a car. <laughs> More people die of car accidents on holiday weekends than anything else. Here's the deal. We've got this thinking where if we are in a game or if we're living life, we live in a culture that it's unacceptable for anyone to lose. can't lose. That's why we're going to give a trophy to everyone. No, no, I'm serious. Why? Do you understand? How many, look, we've all won at stuff, and we've all lost at stuff. I cannot remember hardly any of the victories. I remember the losses. I learned the most from the losses. My life is better because I lost some things. C.S. Lewis is right. In Dante's work, a divine comedy, Dante believes that when, or in his story anyway, when you're approaching hell, there's a big sign over the front and it says, all hope abandon ye who enter here. Wow. If God doesn't want you in hell, why do you want to go there? The truth is you don't, you don't believe you're going there. But you are, unless you're born again. Who said that? Jesus said that. Yes. Don't look at me. I hate you, pastor. <laughs> I didn't say it. Hell is where there's no love. We, don't even, we can't even fathom that. The ugliest, meanest, wickedest person in the world right now is still benefiting from the love of God in this world. Think of it. Hell is where there's no love. And I'm talking, real, I'm talking God's love here. There's no, no love. There's no light. You say, wait a minute, what? No, no, there's no light. Did you know that? How are you with the dark? I'm not talking about a dark room. Years ago, maybe you've been. You can go to the Oregon Caves in Oregon. You go in there, and they take you deep inside the cave. And they take you into the, uh, the Grand Auditorium, I think they call it. It's all natural. It's huge. And then the National Park Ranger gets you all in there, and then he turns off the lights. And at first, everybody goes, oh, oh wow, it's dark. <laughs> and then this, this is what happens. It's really dark. Yeah, it's dark. And then you hear, Mommy, hold my hand. <laughs> no, really. And then you hear, Honey, hold my hand. <laughs> and the ranger's talking about light and particles. And the longer you're in there, the quieter it gets. And he said, You know, when we discovered these caves, we found corpses in this cave, in these caves. <laughs> because people from whatever time would run into the cave or seek shelter, or get lost. They could never find their way out because it was too dark. I know. It's a darkness that can be felt. The park ranger will tell you on that tour that if you are lost inside here, you'll probably go insane within a matter of days. Did you know that heart, uh, hyper heartbeat respiratory, you begin to panic and hyperventilate and it's as though you're in this big spacious room but it's as though you're being suffocated because the darkness starts to crush you and it's all in your mind. 
And the Bible says that hell is dark and no light. There's no love. There's no light. There's no life. I didn't say there weren't living people there. I said there's no life. The Bible is very clear that those who are in hell are very, very much living, but they have no life. So I want to dispel something that a lot of people think is true. Yeah, man, you know what? I don't need Jesus. I'm going to party with my friends. We'll be in hell, and we'll read like magazines, and we'll drink from time to time, and tell dirty jokes. That's what we'll do. No, you won't. No, you won't, because the Bible says it's a place that you're fully, absolutely alone. None of your friends will be there. Well, they may be there. You'll have no knowledge of them being there. The Bible says you are forever falling. You know that feeling? Some people like it. I don't think so. When you add on the rest of the attributes of hell. The Bible says you're on fire. So wait a minute. If you're on fire, there's got to be some light. <laughs> no, there's no light, but you're on fire. You're burning. And the Bible says that you're also in the lake of fire, yet no light, but always on the brink of drowning. The Bible says, Jesus said, it's where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Look, I don't know about you, but I think I'd listen. You know, to what Jesus says about it? You know how stupid your opinion would be right now about what you think hell is like? That God would come and die on the cross so you wouldn't have to go there? Jesus says it's a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what gnashing of teeth means? It means that you move your teeth back and forth until they break. You know, some people in our culture today... There's, you wear bite splints created by your dentist to keep you from breaking your teeth. Did you know that you crack your teeth from stress? You're not going to have a bite splint in hell. Jesus said it's a place where the worm, he's talking about the worm of the grave constantly gnaws on you. Can you imagine just trying to get something away and you're falling and it's pitch black and you feel like you're burning and there's nobody there to comfort you this is why Jesus came. You're not going to hear this. Listen, this is not how you grow a church, giving messages like this. This is called neg negative church growth tactics. <laughs> um, but he doesn't want you there. He wants you with him in heaven. And so I'm, I, I'm going to give you this, and I'm not joking. I know it sounds funny, but I, I, I did this ending because it's, you can relate to it. The entrance into heaven what about it? Very quickly. Uh, there's limited seating available. You say, come on, quit joking around. Some woman heard second service. She called the church. She's all bent out of shape because she thought I said heaven is limited. Like, well, you put it in your pocket. You put it on the shelf. That's heaven. That's not what I said. I said this. There is limited seating available. I didn't make it up. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, enter in by the narrow gate, because wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Yeah. This is the word, these are words of Jesus. Jesus is saying, there's only one way to come. By the way, I am that way, he said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. What about other religions? You're lost. What about other religious groups and gurus and enlightened ones? Lost. What about other uh, religious books and holy books? Lies. There's only one covering the story from the beginning to the end forever. <laughs> Limited seating the Bible says many are called, few are chosen. That means in God's, in God's foreknowledge, he knows those, when the invitation goes out to accept, he knows those who will accept, and he knows those who will reject. Based on his foreknowledge, he knows by predestination. 
that when the opportunity goes to you and you say, I can't accept Jesus. I'm really, I'm dating this hot guy right now. I mean, he might dump me. What's his name? Bill. Bill is Lord. What's, what's her name? I always say Susie, and so people write me and say, you always say Susie. <laughs> I don't know why, but I can't accept Jesus. Susie's really amazing. Lord Susie. She pulls the strings. He's the puppeteer. Susie and Bill will not be there to hold your hand at that moment. Secondly, reservations are required. (laughs) Seating's limited. Reservations are required. Okay, this is going to create a riot. I'm going to just be, just tell like it is. Many of you have come from a church background where you haven't listened to a word I've said today because you don't have to. Because you get to play and do whatever you want to do and then run back quickly and get confession. And if that doesn't work in time, if you get killed on your way to confession, a priest can run over there and give you your last rites. And if that doesn't work and you wind up in purgatory, don't worry about it. You can get out. You know who invented that stuff? Man. That's not in the Bible. Anywhere is it in the Bible. And here's the deal. The Bible says it's appointed to every human, every human being wants to die and then comes their judgment. There's no second chance after that. She said, wait a minute, Pastor, are you kidding me? I thought I could sleep with bubbles and go out and do this with Rocky and then wind up going to heaven eventually. I mean, I've weighed it out at the price. I'm going to do it. Mm. You better watch it. There's no second chance after you're dead. You go straight into eternity, one way or the other, up or down, smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> but you have to have a reservation. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Yes. And then finally we end right here. You need to act now. Why supply last? <laughs> this sounds like a commercial. Well, I'm not selling you anything. But this is true. You know why it's true? Act now while supplies last. Supply is time. You better act now while you have the time. Because you ain't going to have the time. Time's up. Time's up for me. It was eight, eight minutes ago. Time's up was for me. <laughs> you don't know when time's up for you. You don't know. Father, we bow before your word today. How dare we talk about heaven in the future, eternal life, salvation, hope. If we don't appreciate what it is you've rescued us from, we'll never get it. If we don't understand what's at stake, we'll never do the right thing. We don't know the truth, then we're believing a lie. And Lord, I know today, I don't know, I don't even want to know who are first time visitors today. (laughs) But Lord, I trust your sovereign hand. Probably blew their minds out of their head. Well, I pray, dear God, that you'd speak to them. None of us in this room, I trust, are interested in plain Christianity or churchianity or whatever the world is doing right now. We pray, dear God in heaven, that we would be examples and witnesses of the love of God and the truth of God. And there are those times when Jesus comes to the temple and turns over the table, gets a whip and drives people out, rebuking them for their hypocrisy and falsehood. Lord God, we need you to cleanse our lives and to cleanse the church and to wake up the body of Christ in America. We pray for revival. We pray for a great outpouring of the truth across this nation. But what would it matter if all the churches of America opened up their doors and packed out their seats but never got to the truth? What would it profit a pastor if he gained the whole community but wound up losing their souls? Heavenly Father, we need you 
to manifest yourself for this one reason. We don't need to see a miracle. You don't need to do any theatrics. We're asking you to intervene. We're asking you to intervene in our lives personally, in our marriages, in the lives of our children, our grandchildren, our state, our government, our nation. We're asking you to intervene, Almighty God. We need your help. We should have cried out a long time ago. We ask you to forgive us for throwing you out of court and school. Forgive us for converting your name into a curse word. And forgive us for playing church. Dear friends, time is up. You know the answer. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Mine and yours. Everyone's. He paid the price for you to go to heaven, but he will not make you go. You've got to choose to love him. You've got to choose to open your heart. You've got to choose to let him in. Why would you not do that when he has done it all for you? You're not going to go to heaven by default. You've got to ask him. And I'm going to ask you today to ask him. If you're an atheist today and you think you've escaped this message, then please listen because I'm about to ruin your life. I'm going to ask you, Mr. Atheist, Miss Atheist, I'm going to ask you to do something, to be honest with yourself and to do this. Talk to the God that you don't believe in. Ask him if he is speaking to you. If you're an atheist today and you're proud of it, Ask him. Ask the God who doesn't exist. If you're real, let me know. You see, you won't even do that because you're afraid. What are you afraid of? That he'll answer you. Much better, my dear friend, to collapse on your knees. And when he answers you, say to him, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Well, hey, thanks for listening, and uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the Word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button. Tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're going to continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us. No pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us. We're praying for you. God bless you. And we'll see you back here real soon.